The Tick 1994 Cartoon Show Explored. The Tick was an animated show adaptation from the comic book of the same name. Both the comics and the show were created by Ben Edlund. The show first aired in 1994 and ran for three seasons. The show was full of humor, clever plays on existing superheroes, and interesting villains. Yourself. Now, on to the death. We have work to do. It follows the life of a blue superhero who protects a city that is cleverly named The City. He fights crime with his sidekick Arthur, who dresses in a moth suit. The two team up to fight numerous innovative villains like Chairface Chippendale, Sarcastro, and El Cid. The show was initially rejected by Fox Studios for production, but Ben Edlund and Richard Liebman Smith managed to rewrite the script for the pilot, pitched it to Fox Studios again, and got it accepted. That led to the wonderful beginnings of The Tick. Let us get into it and see what makes the show so great. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. What the cartoon television series is all about. Moving away from the mainstream popular shows like Gargoyles and Batman, we have another brilliant animated show, The Tick. The Tick was a comic book that Ben Edlund created and illustrated while still a student in college. After the success of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Kisscom, a licensing and design business from New Jersey, approached Edlund about the possibility of commercializing his characters. However, major TV networks and production companies were apprehensive about producing an animated series based on the quirky characters Edlund had created. After keeping in touch with Edlund, Kisscom remained connected with Edlund and introduced him to Richard Liebman Smith, who worked in the New York-based animation studio Sunbow Entertainment, which produced shows like G.I. Joe, The Mask, and The Transformers. Richard Liebman Smith and Edlund toiled on the debut episode of The Tick for two months, despite never having worked in animation or television. Both of them had little faith in their script, and their fears were confirmed when Fox Studios rejected their initial presentation. However, they were given another chance to improve it within five days. They were able to write a storyline impressive enough in only one weekend, and Fox Studios offered to produce 13 episodes of the show. The series generally stuck to the comic's sarcastic tone, despite lacking the same creative freedom that the comic had when it came to things that might be considered inappropriate for a children's show. Christopher McCulloch, who had known Edlin before their television collaboration had written numerous issues for the series and was another writer for the show. Years down the line, they would collaborate on The Venture Bros, an animated series created by McCulloch for Adult Swim. The Tick's co-producer Edlund was always involved in the process, which led to significant production delays. The character origin of The Tick is not consistent, which is the case with many superheroes. One storyline claims that he broke out of a mental institution and just started protecting the city. However, the storyline that the show follows is different. In the show, the Tick auditions for the National Super Institute, which is an institute where all superheroes in training go. There is an annual competitive test held there to choose which city each superhero would defend. Superheroes that pass will be given the greatest towns to defend against crime. After making it through the trials, the Tick is given the city, a cesspool of villains. When he reaches the city, he meets Arthur, a former accountant who dresses like a moth, whom he he then adopts as a sidekick. The Tick and Arthur defend the city from a bunch of wacky villains with the aid of other heroes including Sewer Urchin, Die Fletter Moss, American Maid and more superheroes. Since there are no limitations in animated form, the heroes and antagonists in the comic book were far more absurd than those who were later featured in the live action versions of the show. It can exist if you can sketch it. Evil doers! Eat my justice! main character and cast of the show. The main character of the show is of course The Tick. He was voiced by Townsend Coleman, whom many of you might recognize as the voice of Michelangelo on the Ninja Turtles. In the show, The Tick described how he destroyed the National Super Institute located in Reno while proving his near invulnerability. How did he do this? Well, he proved his invulnerability using a hazardous gadget that exploded, ended up leveling the entire institute and obviously shocking the judges. 
The Tick was then charged with keeping the city safe. The origin of the Tick from the comic was greatly altered while making the Tick as a cartoon to make it more kid friendly. Similar to comic books, nothing is known about the Tick. He claims that he doesn't remember much of his background and has always been a hero. Even when not on duty, the Tick is never spotted without his outfit. Even when he takes on the role of a normal citizen in the society, he keeps his blue suit on and opts to wear the normal clothes on top of it. Surprisingly enough, he is never recognized as the Tick when he is in this disguise. It reminds me of Clark Kent and his glasses. Now I'm unemployed. How am I gonna find adventure and excitement when I can't even cover my expenses? Our next main character is Arthur. Although he is the Tick sidekick, he is the one who generally has the answers to whatever issues the two of them encounter. Prior to meeting the Tick and teaming up with him to fight crime, Arthur worked as an accountant. He dresses like a moth, but with bunny ears, although his outfit allows him to fly. He was voiced by Mickey Dolenz from The Monkees in the first season, as the producers wanted famous people to voice the characters. However, things fell through with Mickey after the first season. He was then replaced in the second season by a professional voice actor, Rob Paulson, who has played both Raphael and Donatello in the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Other characters include Di Fletter Moss, a supporter of Tick, who is played by Cam Clark. Kay Lenz voiced the American Maid, while Jess Harnell played Sewer Urchin and Human Bullet, whose power essentially entails putting himself into a cannon and blasting himself at the city mindlessly. Legends like Charlie Adler, Jeff Bennett, Pat Fraley, Maurice LaMarche, Dorian Harewood, Bobcat Goldthwaite, Dan Castellaneta, Brad Garrett, Tony Jay, Jennifer Hale, Xander Berkeley, Tress McNeil, Kevin Michael Richardson, Lorraine Newman, Pat Music, Roddy McDowell, and Mark Hamill are also part of the cast. <laughs> The first episode of The Tick was called The Tick vs. The Idea Men. Despite being a pilot episode, it is one of the best episodes in the series. It starts with The Tick and Arthur describing their relationship to an unidentified interviewer when The Tick urges Arthur to talk about their first adventure. It all started when The Tick decided to compete in the National Super Institute's annual competition in Reno, Nevada for the best cities to protect. Tick startled everyone present at the competition by bringing a large box to the stage, placing it there and then opening it to expose a seat and other objects that appear to be lethal. It is the deadliest engine of destruction 1974 had to offer, he says, and then claims that he will live through it. He gets inside of it, turns it on, and swings a little hammer at his face. He initially feels let down, but then a bomb slowly descends onto his head and detonates, destroying the majority of the structure. Then the city appears on the sign listing each hero's chosen city, and the rest is is history, as Tick put it. Tick speaks aloud of his excitement for his new home as they go to the city on a bus. And during the bus ride, we get to see the office where Arthur works. Due to his suit, his manager approaches him and advises him that he is free to seek other possible employment opportunities. Meanwhile, Tick exits the bus and ascends the first tower he sees via the elevator. At the top, he leaps from rooftop to rooftop as Arthur walks below, looking upset. At the same moment, Tick drops and crashes onto the street directly in front of Arthur. He introduces himself as a superhero to Arthur and extends a lunch invitation. It was a quick friendship post that. Due to the fact that Tig does not suck blood, a man asks him whether he is a superhero or not when he is at lunch with Arthur. He retreats and retracts his question after Tig threatens him with a straw. Later, they hear an explosion outside. The caped chameleon immediately rushes out to investigate and so do they. Tig rushes up and falls through the bank skylight, only to spot a group of guys wearing masks leaving the building. The crashing through the skylight obviously alerts the men and causes them to point their weapons at the two, which then causes Arthur to pass out. Meanwhile, inside the bank, the caped chameleon creeps along one of the walls, blending in until he approaches the drapes. He stops at the drapes only because the poor man simply cannot do played. During that time, the guys yell at the tick indistinctly in muffled voices because of their masks. The tick then causes them to drop the cash by grabbing a desk and throwing it at them. Unfortunately, the guys are able to run away before they can be caught. Later, the mayor of the city appears on a news program that was playing footage of the incident and says that he has a reason to suspect the idea men are up to something greater. 
Tig and Arthur go to Arthur's flat, where Tig is dismayed to learn that Arthur doesn't have any covert crime-fighting tools. I mean, the poor guy was an accountant, Tig. The Tig then starts flipping through the TV stations when he discovers a news program about the Idea Men's most recent heist, which involved planting a bomb in a dam and demanding a hefty ransom. This news seems to make something click in his brain, so he wakes Arthur up and lets him know that they have a crime to stop. The next sequence features a montage of superheroes failing in their attempts to rescue the day and defeat the Idea Men. Meanwhile, Tick and Arthur go up to a tower where we see a hesitant Arthur who won't fly to the crime scene. Tick pushes Arthur over the roof since he is in a hurry, which is clearly really considerate of him. But Arthur manages to fly, so good for him, I guess. Tick follows him closely as they traverse the roof till they get to the park where the dam is. They run into Die Fletter Moss and American Maid there. For context, the two are ex-partners, so they are arguing while Tick makes an effort to mediate. Just then, a shadowy person appears somewhere else. This person is none other than Big Shot, a deranged anti-hero with a pistol that has no desire to put the bad guys in jail. Instead, he wants to put them six feet under. As the mayor gets ready to pay the money to the idea men, Big Shot approaches on foot. The air is thick with tension and a taxi cab pulls up outside the dam, while Tick and Arthur are still rushing to save the day. The Idea Men celebrate their win inside after receiving the money, but they decide to detonate the bomb anyway, you know, for the kicks. By this time, Tick has reached, and he charges up and knocks them all to the ground. He unmasks one of the Idea Men and asks him how to deactivate it, but they are unable to, so Tick, unfazed, plunges his hands into the explosive. This is the moment Big Shot arrives. He dashes inside and starts shooting. Tick swiftly diffuses the situation with a joke, after realizing that his hands are trapped within it. The Tick then rushes to the top of the dam where the explosion ignites the Idea Men's airship and ends their threat. The episode concludes with Human Bullet crashing into the dam but having no more impact than dropping into the river. And you can thank my dental hygienist for our untimely aliveness. Party's over, chair face. The second episode starts with Tick and Arthur monitoring the city. So far, they haven't seen any disturbances throughout their hours of patrolling. But as convenience would have it, a distant alarm sounds. Three villains, Boils, Zipperneck, and Forehead, are trying to steal a big crate. Still, they are swiftly overpowered by Tick and Arthur. Fortunately for Tick and Arthur, American Maid shows up to help. But Forehead escapes with the container. The good news is that one of them accidentally dropped an invitation to check Chairface Chippendale's birthday party, which was set for that evening. American Maid reluctantly agrees to take Tick and Arthur with her. Later that evening, Professor Chrome Dome, Chairface's right-hand man, receives the gift from Forehead when he arrives at his mansion. Professor Chrome Dome then hands it to Chairface and reveals that it contains the Geisman lenses, which can transform a regular candle's light into an incredibly potent heat ray. While that is happening at the party, Arthur and Tick are picked up by American Maid after preventing Sewer Urchin from accompanying them on their assignment. American Maid then explains to them that they are entering the party undercover as caterers. The party is on in full swing, where the city's most evil criminals are present, including Chairface, who is going to receive a new henchman named Dean. Dean is said to have the strongest hands in the criminal world. Everything was going smoothly up until their secret cover was compromised, and Chrome Dome trapped Arthur, American Maid, and Tick. Then Chairface decides to tell them his entire plan. His brilliant plan was to write his name over the surface of the moon to make sure that no one would ever forget him. He does this since he spent his entire life being rejected because of the way he looked. The reason makes me want to sympathize with him, but I also do not like the idea of a defaced moon. Unfortunately, our three heroes won't be present for the christening of the moon, since Chairface decided to lower them into his alligator pit. Nonetheless, they are superheroes, so they are able to flee by swinging to a vent. As the heroes ascend a perilous cliff, Chairface blows out the candles on his birthday cake, delivers a speech, and Chrome Dome gets ready to fire the heat ray. While Chairface is trying to write his name on the moon, Arthur blocks the beam at the end of the first A, and American Maid pursues Chairface while Tick fends against the bad guys. Tick manages to beat Dean, which is not surprising considering that Tick is indestructible while Arthur uses the heat ray lamp to blind Chrome Dome. American Maid fights Chairface, who 
is then roasted against the wall. However, he pulls a sneaky one when he opens a hidden compartment and retrieves a pistol. However, Tick's threat to use the heat ray destroys Chairface's smug look pretty quickly. The culprits are hauled away as Chairface swears revenge. Tick speaks of American Maid's golden heart while Arthur's face has a mildly disgusted look. And the episode comes to a close. Arthur, fight that wild hair! The third episode is titled The Tick vs. Dinosaur Neil. This episode begins with the Tick giving a speech from a rooftop in the morning, eager to embrace the day. I don't know what he is so optimistic about so early in the morning, that too without his coffee, but good for him. The scene then cuts to Arthur groggily waking up. Now this I can relate to a lot more. As Arthur gets ready for his usual morning patrol with the Tick, he is also shocked by how vivacious Tick is in the morning. But there is a good news for Arthur because Tick tells him that today is their day off and they are heading to an educational theme park called the Dinosaur Grotto. Tick chats excitedly to Arthur on the bus about the ongoing dinosaur excavation in the park. Arthur informs Tick that going out and all would be okay as long as they can get home in time for dinner that they had scheduled with Dot. Arthur's sister. The only thing about Dot is that she disapproves of Arthur's superhero lifestyle. Still, Tick, being the exuberant optimist that he is, insists that everything is great. Arthur is obviously not reassured by that and ensures that Tick promises to not embarrass him in front of Dot. Later, when Tig and Arthur's tour group leaves Dinosaur Grotto, their tour guide, Dinosaur Neil, bids them farewell and expresses his delight at their enthusiasm. He then extends an invitation to Tig and Arthur to come and observe what he calls science you can't get in a textbook in his tent. There, he shows them the dinosaur tissue that has been prevented from growing in a dish of acetyl salicylic acid, while explaining his intention to reproduce dinosaurs using their remains. Sadly, Neil swallows the dinosaur tissue by accident Accident, since his pasta salad was served in a bowl that is almost exactly like that of the one containing the dinosaur tissue. He tells his visitors that everything is okay, all while being drenched in sweat. Arthur is frightened as they say goodbye, because Neil's hands are becoming claws and turning green. His body is expanding, and slowly his claws start shredding his outfit. Later, we see a huge dinosaur with Neil's face fumbling with an aspirin bottle in Neil's tent. Unfortunately, the bottle has a child safe lid which makes Neil furious, causing him to rush out and we see his thoughts changing into that of an animal's. Arthur and Tick finish preparing the house just in time for Dot, who is met with a theatrical compliment from Tick. However, Dot is still unimpressed by the Tick. But just then, a news report on Neil's rampage interrupts the movie they were watching on TV. We can see Tick physically trembling with his urge to battle the monster, while Mayor Blank some the National Guard to stop the dinosaur. Arthur ignores his need for his sister's approval and goes with Tick to fight the dinosaur and protect the city. The duo catches up to Neil and tries to reason with him, but there is only so much you can do to a primitive being with incoherent thoughts. So Tick gets knocked through the building's roof instead. Arthur then recalls what Neil had said about acetylsalicylic acid keeping the tissue tiny, but gets caught by Neil's mustache somehow. The Tick quickly manages to free him, but is knocked aside. Arthur then tells Tick about his strategy to defeat Neil. While Human Bullet makes an effort to beat Neil, Arthur and Tick head to a drugstore to get a large aspirin for Neil. Tick and Arthur show up just before the National Guard is about to shoot Neil. They explain their plan to give him aspirin and beg in front of the National Guard for five minutes in order to be able to carry it out. Arthur also breaks the fourth wall at this moment by talking about the history and effects of aspirin. Before Tick can feed Neil the aspirin, he gets a bit down on on by Neil, who juggles him about on his tongue and bites on his skull. All of this happens before he can ask Arthur how to get Neil to take the aspirin. Thankfully, Tick thinks fast in this situation and rushes for the throat as soon as he spots a gap and drops the aspirin down it. But Human Bullet hits Neil's stomach seconds later, forcing him to spew the aspirin even though it is still in his mouth. A couple of the city superheroes watch the new story while Tick engages in a wrestling match with Neil's tongue. As the medication is being thrown down Nick's throat, Tick continues to struggle with Neil's tongue within his mouth until ultimately forcing his tongue and shoving the pill down his throat. Just when it seems like the observers on the outside appear to have lost all hope, Tick escapes from his jaws and Neil shrinks back to normal size. A grateful Neil praises Tick and Arthur for saving him when they bring him back to Arthur's flat. And Dot is moved by their bravery. The episode ends with Neil and Dot dancing while Arthur and Tig doing the dishes.
Best episodes of the Tick 1994 cartoon show. Armless, but not harmless. Venus and Milo, two low-grade adversaries, blast Tick and Arthur with an innovative new ray gun that they created, causing Tick and Arthur's arms to fall off. Our heroes respond exactly how you might anticipate. Tick is perplexed and visibly upset, while Arthur goes about yelling and having a breakdown. Watching their futile attempt to use a payphone to contact American Maid for assistance is amazing. Meanwhile, Venus and Milo send several crude androids on crime spree after attaching Tick and Arthur's arms to them. This ends up making the two villains eligible candidates for the coveted enemy awards of supervillainy. The only person who can put a stop to this nightmare, it seems, is Plunger Man. Even though the robots don't even remotely resemble Tick and Arthur, everyone is misled, and our superheroes find themselves being chased by the very law they protect. The classic trope of heroes who get mistaken for villains gets a very bizarre twist when the protagonists battle their own errant disembodied limbs. Ants in Pants In a previous episode, the Tick had told Arthur that he was going sane in a crazy world. This episode then proceeds to expand on that rather complicated statement. But then again, in what sane universe would an ant colony disguise itself as people in order to collect enough glass to create a massive magnifying glass that would kill everyone? The Tick then visits Captain Sanity's superhero sanatorium for counseling. After originally being completely freaked out by the episode's namesake, and in pants. Little does he know that Captain Sanity's notion of psychotherapy is to have a nurse called Nurse Taft wrestle with the tick while donning a variety of absurd costumes. Captain Sanity, by the way, is a detached head in what seems to be a water cooler. The military also tries to come up with solutions in this episode. Their way of solving this problem was to make a massive pair of trousers to entice the ants. But naturally, these massive pants catch fire. So, for the sake of the city, the tick escapes the sanitary and vanquishes the ants after realizing that sanity is among the most glorified things in the world. Gibberish. Mustache, I will not be mocked by you! That mustache feeling. The Tick and his friends believe he has attained a new peak of sharpness when he wakes up with an enigmatic mustache. The perplexing part is that Tick is consistently clean-shaven. So how did he get such gorgeous facial hair all of a sudden? There is a character called Jim Rage who resembles Nick Fury in this episode. He gathered a group called Shave, a group of heroines from 1970s to seek his new mustache. The mustache was a really fun episode where he was unable to trim his mustache and for some reason it was able to reach inside his nostrils and touch his brain. It was a very visually stimulating episode, you can say. This episode also served as the model for Spider-Man's sidewalk strut in Spider-Man 3. Sadly, not every arachnid superhero has the same kind of flounce. Nothing, chum. I put it on your credit cards. What? The Tick vs. Arthur's Bank Account This was the first and regrettably the only episode to get an Annie Award for its script writing. The Tick creates some of its own iconic war cries in this episode and is overjoyed when the Terror, the evilest sanitarian on this side of Mr. Burns, emerges back from retirement. To wreak havoc on the city from his mobile spider castle, the Terror recruits the human ton, man-eating cow, Handy, Tunla, and Joseph Stalingrad. The Tick goes all out and uses all of Arthur's credit cards to purchase several crime-fighting gadgets in order to confront these combined villains as they combine their forces. When Arthur learns that Tick maxed out his credit cards, he forces the Tick to leave his apartment and go back to his rickety crime-busting tower. Honestly, that tower is so ancient that it might just be a rundown old pigeon coop. This episode is clearly one of the most intriguing ones. Beware, it has a lot of violence, specifically graphic puppet violence. I am that jerk who wants to know. The Tick vs. The Tick In this episode, two-time honored customs, clubbing and superheroes wailing on one another for bogus justifications are merged and mocked. The Tick encounters Barry, a barely sane hero at a posh club called Comet Club, when he and his friends head for a night of caped fun. Barry also likes to go by the name The Tick for some reason, and doesn't feel like sharing the name. Meanwhile, Arthur is sent to the depressing sidekick's lounge by the doorman. There is a hue and a cry over which the two superheroes will stop the evil Midnight Bomber that bombs at midnight for blowing up everyone in the city. 
The Little Wooden Boy and the Belly of Love The interdependency of the Tick and Arthur is possibly the greatest motive in the whole series. Nevertheless, the introduction of Carmelita in this episode completely appends that dynamic. The Tick feels insulted that his sidekick decided to forego Hobby Knight to spend time with a lady, the Blasphemy, after she and Arthur became friends because of their shared love for moth suits. To deal with the loss of his sidekick, Tick creates the ultimate sidekick called Little Wooden Boy. In the episode, we have Blowhole, a gigantic whale dressed in lederhosen who is now marching around the country. This episode tugs at every heartstring from the success of love to the sadness of the self-sacrifice of a board of wood with a face painted on it. Another episode that deserves a special mention is episode 10, The Tick Love Santa from season 2. As the Tick and Arthur make their way home after completing their holiday shopping, a thief escapes from the police. The thief continues to elude the police by changing into a Santa outfit. Unfortunately for him, he collides with the Tick head on. However, the Tick lets the thief escape because he is happy to meet Santa. The Tick even tries to help Santa when he sees the police. The burglar finally falls on the ground after slipping and sliding from a roof and into an electric sign. The Tick and Arthur try to host a Christmas party, but Tick is embarrassed that he fried Santa. The party attendees, who are also superheroes, attempt to inform the Tick that Santa Claus is not real. The idea that superheroes may believe such things disgusts the Tick. The thief was fine, and he picked himself up and questioned why no one had checked in on him. Just then, the thief sees five clones and finds out that they follow all his instructions. This Santa army then breaks into an electronic store and steals a lot of merchandise under the thief's command. The Tick's party group is out caroling and encounters the group of Santas, who promptly run away from there. This causes a dilemma, where the Tick is forced to choose between defending the city and defending Santa. However, the Tick finds himself incapable of striking a Santa. When the robber, who is now known as Multiple Santa, is struck into an electric box, additional clones emerge. The clones defeat the superheroes before continuing their invasion of the city even more. The Tick and Arthur return to their apartment after losing. Poor Arthur keeps making an effort to persuade the Tick that Santa Claus is a myth, but Tick is not ready to hear it. But the pair are then met by several Secret Service elves inside their residence. The Tick sees Santa Claus, who commends him for maintaining his faith and orders him to put an end to the bad Santas. He also distributes presents, such as chocolates. Arthur takes out a pop gun he was given as a child and exclaims how happy he is that Santa is real. The elves smash the pistol after claiming that it is dangerous. After apologizing, Santa gives the Tick a pencil set instead. The multiple Santa must be stopped, so the Tick and Arthur set off. They receive a report from Santa Claus that multiple Santa had gone to the dam to utilize the electricity to increase the size of the Santa army. The two move in the direction of the dam, but realize they are too late. Multiple Santa had already accessed the dam and shocked themselves, causing a flood of Santas. To reach multiple Santa, the Tick must figuratively swim through the Santas. When a brawl breaks out, the Tick is forced to defend, striking Santa once more. Instead he decides to give the copycat a noogie. This is when he realizes that the static charge will destroy the clone. The clones are then noogied by the Tick, who then unleashes a surge of static electricity that kills the rest of them. The Tick and the city's other residents are free to celebrate Christmas once again after many Santas are apprehended. The Tick is also happy to have his idea of Santa and Christmas preserved. That's it. Keep on trucking. <laughs> What happened to the Tick franchise? The superhero, the Tick, who battles crime while wearing a blue Tick costume, is nearly impervious to harm. He also has no recollection of his life before becoming a superhero. Each iteration of the character has a different origin story. The initial comics claim he is presumably legally crazy and escaped from a mental institution, while the most recent series chose to keep it unclear. Many viewers who were unfamiliar with the original material or earlier incarnations were drawn to the Tick because it is a superhero satire. Creator of the monster superhero known as The Tick, cartoonist Ben Edlund first used the character as a newsletter mascot in 1986. In 1988, the character's popularity led to the creation of an independent comic book series. It was transformed into an animated TV series in 1994. The Tick's first live-action adaptation debuted on November 8, 2001 and was cancelled on January 31, 2002, making it the franchise's only transient 
transient media adaptation. Patrick Warburton played the title character in the original live-action adaptation in 2001. In 2016, Amazon gave the show a fresh start with Peter Serafinowicz playing the blue suit protagonist. Sadly, the second and the most current live-action adaptation of The Tick was cancelled on April 5th, 2019, and there will only now be two seasons. It debuted on Amazon Prime on August 18th, 2016, and it was somewhat well-liked. Despite the fact that all three of Tick's media adaptations were cancelled, they were regarded as cult masterpieces. The pilot episode of The Tick, which debuted on August 18th, 2016, was followed by a half season of five episodes in 2017 and the last six episodes of the season in February of 2018. The second season was bought by Amazon and it debuted in April 2019, and then it was cancelled six weeks later. It was never explained why, although it probably had something to do with the viewing. Even though Amazon Video doesn't realize its ratings as many other streaming services do, given how well received the take was, all signs point to viewership numbers being the cause of the Tick's cancellation. While the series had a devoted following, it probably wasn't as large as Amazon required. A series will probably be cancelled if its ratings fall short of a target level. While superhero worlds like Marvel and DC tend to treat things more seriously, the Tick is hailed by critics for his comedy and enduring characters. While the cartoon version has been more successful so far because it is a lot easier to animate the villains that Edlin creates, the live-action show translated more of the adult humor of the comics into it. Although Edlin made every effort to find a new home on different platforms for The Tick, he disclosed on his Twitter account in 2019 that the search had been fruitless and that with the performer's contracts about to expire, the show had unfortunately come to an end. Edlin also stated that although the series had come to an end, they would still search for new options for The Tick and his crew. The Tick was a really interesting show with a lot of creative superheroes and villains. There was a lot of clever play on the existing superheroes from the various comic verses in the comics and the TV show. The show was a completely unique and wonderful take on the mainstream superhero content, giving the entire genre a fresh perspective. The blue-suited hero was truly a delight to watch. What do you think of The Tick? Let us know in the comments below. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone. Uh.